Good evening. Welcome to the meeting of the Armour Select Board of December 5th, 2023. This is a hybrid meeting which requires that I read the following notice into the record. This is the formally advised that is required by General Laws Chapter 30A, Sections 18 through 25, and pursuant to Chapter 20 of the Acts of 2021, an act relative to extending certain COVID-19 measures adopted during the state of emergency, signed into law on June 16, 2021, and is extended by Chapter 2 of the Acts of 2023, the Armour Select Board will hold a public meeting on Tuesday, December 5th, 2023 at 6 p.m. in the hearing room, Yarmouth Town Hall, 1146 Route 28 South Yarmouth. The public is welcome to attend either in person or via the alternative public access provided below. And on our website, we have the instructions to come into the meeting by Zoom or by telephone. Please rise for the Pledge of Allegiance. The first item is public announcements. Do we have any announcements? Anyone? No, I guess not. Okay, and then we'll move to public comments. Vita. You have seniority, Vita. Over everybody in the town. Okay, so um, uh, I was just given a, a copy of the entire uh, housing plan report uh, or uh, uh, plan, and uh, I only had a chance to glance a, um, uh, a little bit on, on my tablet before it started crashing on me constantly <laughs> several times because of the length of this document, I guess, but I would say... Um, this seems like a very uh, comprehensive, uh, very well done um, uh, document that uh, seems to have a lot of interesting information. Uh, a few of the things that I saw, including uh, information from the uh, 2020 census already, the data from that. And um, so I just wanted to congratulate Mary and Mary and her uh, uh, colleagues who produced this. and. Uh, then, uh, I, uh, glancing through it, I found that uh, the Forest Road uh, project apparently has been nixed, at least temporarily, and when I asked uh, how that happened, I understand that we owe this to, to this board. And so thank you very much, because uh, I just hope that you will continue keeping an eye out on those people who are pushing that project and that uh, 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 somehow we can uh, get back to get back that uh, property and, and declare it to be non-buildable in, in the future. Uh, but anyway, thank you for at least temporarily stopping the whole thing. Um, and now, unfortunately, <laughs> as I was driving here on the car radio, uh, the school district strikes again. It, uh, they, they had an advertisement uh, looking for students for the middle school. I, you know, I, this is this is uh, uh, amazing. All we need is for somebody to uh, 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 send a message to Boston there, and and we'll have another huge uh, influx of illegal aliens here with the, with their kids. If, if we uh, have all these spaces available, I can't believe that happened. They they had been advertising up until the kerfuffle arose over the illegal aliens, and then they had stopped it. And this is the, at least the first time that I heard it. I, I can't believe they're doing that. I really can't. Thank you. Thank you, Vita. Hi. I'm Cheryl Ball, and I wanted to come tonight to uh, talk about two items that are not on the agenda tonight. Um, one is the Yarmouth Resort. 
Uh, it's been a little bit of a time since we've had any kind of update as to what is going on over there. Um, I think there's a lot of us that are still curious as to why there are individuals living in there, if there are building code violations. Uh, we'd like to know what the fate of that building is going to be. Um, I've been in contact with the owner of the commercial building next door, and he's also very concerned. He said he's been unable to get any answers from the town as to what's going on over there. Um, one of the reasons I'm here asking about it is because we just learned last week that the two individuals that have ownership interest in the Yarmouth Resort, um, Dalip and Ashok Patel, have also been part of a deal that just went down with the purchase of the Bayside Resort. Um, those two individuals are president and vice president of Jamson Management, and Jamson Management has just purchased the Bayside Resort. So seeing what happened at the Yarmouth Resort, I'm also concerned as to what the fate of the Bayside Resort will be. Um, finally, with respect to the Yarmouth Resort, I don't know if this board is aware, but on Friday, all day long, there was a woman standing out front with a shopping cart and all of her worldly belongings. Uh, I went over and spoke with her. She is indeed homeless, Yarmouth's newest homeless resident, I guess. Um, I did get her contact information. I reached out to Kip Diggs and Julian Sear, sent them an email. I have received no response. Um, apparently, they not only didn't respond to me, they didn't respond to her either because over the weekend, I saw her pushing that same shopping cart along Main Street in Hyannis. So that's the first set of comments I want to make. Um, I just think it's absolutely reprehensible <laughs> that an American citizen is standing out on the side of Route 28, while in contrast, we have our illegal aliens living comfortably over at the Harborside Suites with all of their needs taken care of. I think it's shameful. So speaking of the Harborside Suites, um, there are a lot of us that are curious what's going on over there as well. Um, many of us that drive by it have noticed that there's a large construction project going on outside. We don't know what that construction project is. Um, regardless of what it is, I think our bigger concern is who's paying for it? And is that something that is going to be a cost to the town um, since we don't know what it is? And then finally, uh, with respect to the Harborside Suites as well, um, it has come to my attention that there are four confirmed cases of tuberculosis at Harborside. And others may be pending because not everyone has been tested. Um, this information has been known for a couple of weeks, and it has not been made public to the Yarmouth residents and taxpayers. Um, it's been quite a while since we've had any update on our town website about the Harborside Suites. I believe October 26th is the last date we received an update. So I think we deserve to be informed as to what is going on over there, um, especially now that there also seems to be a public health concern. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else? Tom Sullivan has his hand up on the... Who? Tom? Tom. On the screen? Yep. Tom Sullivan. Uh, good evening, Mr. Chairman. How are you this evening? Good evening, Tom. How are you doing? Pretty good. Um, today, this afternoon, I received an email from Epsilon. Uh, Epsilon is the company that's doing the environmental assessment at the airport. Um, I talked to Mrs. Greeley on this, and uh, I got her blessing to speak here tonight on it. Uh, one thing on the connecting on the email to read the assessment uh, for this December 12th meeting, uh, it goes to a dead end, doesn't work. It just leaves you uh, hanging at the uh, airport webpage. Two, uh, uh, well, I wanna bring this up. I did forward an email to Mr. Rittenauer. I don't know if he got a copy of this earlier today. So um, if he didn't, uh, this is, I'm just bringing it to the board's attention that, uh, in their other section, they want written comments submitted before the December 12th meeting so they can screen them. <coughs> they don't want the comments at the meeting. And I think this is intolerable. And it should not be allowed. You know, I've been dealing with this airport off and on now for 20 years plus. And this is the low ball for me. Uh, it might be good in other places, but I don't think it's good for here. 
uh, to have written comments submitted beforehand uh, and they won't be allow people to speak at the meeting, then why even have a meeting? So I would urge the board uh, to write a letter objecting to this and also with Mr. Rittenauer also, okay? And the, the other thing I'd just like to bring your attention, because uh, I, I heard you reference in the uh, tonight about the select board. At town meeting, we changed the name from selectman to select board. But what we didn't do is change the charter. For that to be effective in the town, it must be changed in the charter. And it has not been changed in the charter, which when we change the charter, that has to be approved by the legislature. So as far as using the term select board, I don't think it should be used until you change the charter. Okay, thank you, Mr. Chairman. No one else up there? Nobody else? Nope. Okay. All right, the next item is recognition of December retirees, Jane Fogarty, Natural Resources, retirement date effective December 8th of 2023. And is Bill going to come up and Absolutely. address us on that? All right. Good evening, I'm back again. You're losing everybody. <laughs> I promise I'm not pushing them out the door. Uh, but uh, I would like to thank the board again for recognizing all our retirees, particularly Jane. I mean, uh, Jane's been here 38 years. Uh, I only hope I can do her career uh, justice in just a few minutes speech. Uh, <clears throat> I've given it some thought. And the best way for me to try to describe Jane is as a champion of people. She's a champion to the residents and visitors of the town of Yarmouth, who she has served all these years. She's been a champion to the town that has employed her and that she has honorably served and represented. And she's been a champion to her peers and co-workers who she has served alongside. Jane started her career in 1985 as a police dispatcher. Ironically, at 424 Route 28, which was then the old police station and is now the natural resource office where she is retiring as an administrative assistant. She tells me that she started with a typewriter and a punch card when she started at dispatch. <laughs> this was long before the days of 911. Uh, I guess the punch card was a little bigger than an index card and the dispatchers would type all the information from a call on it. Each time they typed a new entry to do with that call, they would punch the card with a timestamp. When responding officers uh, returned to the station, they, would, they could add narrative to the cards that corresponded to the calls that they responded to. I guess it was routine too, the Cape Cod Times would call the station every night to ask um, what was going on and, and this is how they got their information. Uh, this just kind of paints a picture of how different things were back then and the type of change that Jane has seen over the course of her career. Eventually, I think in the early 90s, 911 came along, and Jane and the rest of the dispatchers would become certified 911 operators. And of course, all the other systems and technology would advance to where it is now. Excuse me. When I say that Jane has been a champion of people, this is something that has resonated throughout her whole career. Jane has always taken the time to spend with people who were calling for assistance and to make sure that they felt they were being heard no matter who they were or why they were calling. Jane is a very compassionate and empathetic person. She truly cares about other people, gives with all her heart and soul and wants nothing in return. We at Natural Resources have over 600 mooring and slip holders uh, that Jane deals with on a regular basis and who she has developed really great rapports with. Uh, it's absolutely been amazing. Upon Jane's retirement announcement, the amount of these mooring and slip holders that have taken the time out of their days to call and talk to Jane and wish her well 
or actually take the time to come into the office for no other reason than to thank Jane for all of her help and wish her well. They had no other business to conduct at the office. Uh, this is a true testament to the type of representative of the town that Jane has been. <coughs> Jane has always been a team player and looked at her coworkers as family, fostering that environment. <clears throat> She's always the one in the office to make sure we don't miss anyone's birthday. Little things like this have really cemented together our team at DNR. Jane has mourned and grieved with and supported her YPD family over the loss of coworkers and family members who have made the ultimate line of duty sacrifice. Again, the town of Yarmouth has not just been a workplace for Jane, but a family sharing all the ups and downs that families share. I also mentioned that Jane was a champion to the town body and the town staff. Jane has served as a union shop steward and negotiator for most of her career and served as the SEIU Local 888 Chapter President for over 10 years. In this time, Jane has fostered a very strong working relationship between the union and town administration. Jane has worked tirelessly to negotiate fair and equitable contracts, as well as fair solutions to other issues, and always looked at issues with an open mind. I think we all owe Jane a great deal of gratitude for all of her contributions. We wish her well in her next chapter. Jane will still have interactions with the town for the next few years as she will be working directly for SEIU 888 as an internal organizer. We know she'll do a great job there, as always. Jane? <laughs> I just want to say I spent more than half of my life working for this town. And the 38 and a half years went by really, really fast. But I was blessed to have two jobs that I really, really loved, along with some great coworkers who I considered friends. And obviously, I really appreciate administration, the select board, for supporting um, me through my entire career. Um, I've I keep saying I have bookends. I started out with a bob, I ended up with a bob, and I got very lucky. Just like I went full circle starting out at 424 Route 28 and ended up at 42428. Um, I want to thank you all for everything, um, and I wish you all the best. Thank you. And before you go, we have a citation for you from the town, um, and it reads as follows. Be it known that the town of Yarmouth hereby recognizes Jane L. Fogarty on her retirement as administrative assistant, effective December 8, 2023, and for dedicated service to the town of Yarmouth. Be it further known that the town of Yarmouth extends its sincerest thanks and appreciation for over 38 years of tireless service, first in the police dispatch and then in the Natural Resources Division. This citation is duly signed by the chair of the Yarma Select Board on this fifth day of December in the year of our Lord, 2023, and I have signed it on behalf of each and every member of the board, and if you come forward and accept this, please. That's a lot of years of service, <laughs> 38 years, my God. Okay, next item, if we are ready, is our 6.30 item, uh, amendments to the entertainment license for Thatcher Hall, 266 Route 6A Yarmouth Port. This was a, this was this this was an advertised hearing, was it?
Has anybody got a copy of the packet? Can I see that? That would be easier just to get the notice out of there. Good evening. Good evening. So, back again. Oh, we love it here. <laughs> I am going to, when I find it, read the notice into the record, and then we can begin the actual hearing. Legal notice, <clears throat> which appears to have been published on or about November 24th, reads as follows. The Board of Selectmen acting as the local licensing authority for the town of Yarmouth has received an application for an amendment of an annual weekday and Sunday entertainment license from Yarmouth New Church Preservation Foundation, DBA, Thatcher Hall, 266 Route 6A, Yarmouth Port. Susan, is it Moeller? Is that how you pronounce it? Correct. Ma manager. Thatcher Hall is keeping their existing licenses and proposing to include new entertainment, including but not limited to wedding ceremonies, dance performances, comedy shows, fitness classes, dance classes, and open houses. The proposed amended weekday entertainment hours will be Monday through Saturday from 9 a.m. to 10 p.m., and Sunday from 9 a.m. to 10 p.m. The hearing will be held on Tuesday, December 5th, 2023, at Yarmouth Town Hall, 1146 Route 28 South Yarmouth. The selectmen's meeting begins at 6 p.m. Written comments will be accepted until 4.30 p.m. Friday, December 1st, 2023, at the licensing department located at the town hall or can be submitted electronically to public comment at yarmouth.ma.us. Okay, tell us what you would like us to do. Um, the, the first thing I want to say to you is, maybe this will save a little time, hopefully it will, um, included but not limited to language that has its place but not here. That means you can do anything you want to do not just what you're asking for, and we can't do that. We can't license you for anything and everything of an entertainment nature. We have to know what it is that you want to do and when you want to do it. So um, <laughs> that's something more you see in legal documents. This first time I've seen it in an application for an entertainment license. So let's go through the things that you want to do and talk about them. All right. I think that might save, save you some time. Um, okay, wedding ceremonies. Is that entertainment, a wedding? I, I mean, clearly a wedding reception is. But a wedding ceremony, do you, do you need an entertainment license for a wedding ceremony? Honestly, I don't know, but I mean, we wanted to make does the Catholic sure. Church and Station Ave need an entertainment license to do weddings? We aren't a church. We're, well, so, you were a church at one point. You were a Swedenborgian church historically. Correct. Um, but is that entertainment, a wedding license? I don't think so. I, I think the issue, and we talked about this a little earlier, was that there was a, a desire in one of the earlier discussions that we had to conduct wedding receptions. Correct. Correct. And, and that, that the wedding reception, and this had come up in another venue yeah. as well, yeah. uh, the wedding reception needed to be a part of the entertainment license, and that a wedding ceremony itself, uh, that, that part, did not necessarily represent yeah. entertainment. I mean, I'm not saying we're against it or we're prohibiting weddings. I'm just saying is that something we have to license as a form of entertainment. But I think we just need to clarify, if, if there's going to be a reception, there's a lot of times people like to do both. get married and then do the reception right there. And that was where the discussion came up of the entertainment license. Yeah. But, and I think that the way we had sort of explained it was, well, you're okay to do the, the ceremony, but you can't do a reception there until you get 
the, the license amended and that that was one of the things that we sort of had on the list of one of potential. Let's, let's move on beyond that and just go through the list here, okay? Um, dance performances. It shouldn't be a problem, right? No, it's, I mean. That's entertainment. Comedy shows. That seems to be entertainment. Fitness classes. I suppose that is, right? Could be. Some people say it's torture. Some people would say <laughs> it's fun. I don't know. Um, dance classes. Um, and open houses. I don't think you need an entertainment license to do an open house. Why would you? Well, for example... How is that entertainment or an open house? Um, at um, the Christmas stroll yesterday, uh, we had a magician that was actually put there by the Chamber of Commerce um, who performed, who did a couple of performances in the right. afternoon. So we just, I think in filling out the form, um, it was a little unclear to us exactly um, what was covered under entertainment licenses, obviously, but we wanted to make sure that we were covered for what we were doing and that we were being both compliant with what the town wanted as well as being a good neighbor. Yeah, I went two years ago and they actually had music, they had people playing instruments and they had, I think they had some choir folks and stuff like that. Um, I don't know, I, I'm just thinking out loud here, could we put the Yarmouth's I'm a stroll as a as an event instead of breaking down all the things that maybe you do because that could change from year to year also correct right yes. if I may um, Marianne Agresti um, I think part of the concern in working with this is that when we submitted our original license application, we did not list wedding receptions because as you're saying, we figured it was included in the other categories we had submitted. So part of what we felt like we were sort of responsible for in this revised application was to be overly specific because originally we thought we covered everything, but then we were at when, when, when the application was applied for the wedding reception, we were told that it wasn't specifically listed, so we could not do it. So we're just a little confused about how specific we have to be. You know, I, I think one of the problems, very frankly, is the, the breadth of what you're asking for. And I don't have a problem with that. It's just when we get applications for entertainment, they're usually a lot more limited. Somebody will say, you know, we're going to have musical instruments, so many musicians, uh, that kind of thing. This is... And I can see it because of the facility. It's you want to open it to almost like the cultural center, a lot of different things, and um, make sure that you enumerate the things you want to do. So I, think I get that. Our goal. But you can't have a license to do everything. You just can't. The, you, the, the events have to be, or the things that you're going to be doing have to be uh, named. I guess what we're struggling, go ahead. If I could ask a question. Um, you mentioned the cultural center. What is the license of the cultural center? Because the cultural center does a lot of the exact same things that are being asked for here. I, I there's, a, there's, a potpourri, there's a potpourri of items that happen at the cultural center. Now, they may not have asked for entertainment license for those. Should they have or should they not have? But I, I know they do wedding receptions. I know they have dancing. I know they have music. I know they have exercise classes. I know they have regular classes. I know they have art drawing classes. Yeah. And, 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 I don't have, and I don't have a problem with that. But I do have a problem if they say, we want to do A, B, C, D, E, F, and G, uh, and anything else we want to do. Or, putting it another way, we want an entertainment license to include A, B, C, D, E, F, and G. No, you, you, you got to We got to know what's going on there. We got to license particular. And I don't know anything um, problematical about having a, a an extensive list of of things. But I'm just saying we can't have unenumerated uh, events. I I guess I'm a little. 
I'm trying to figure out the solution mm. that if we removed that language from the application of of what you're concerned about. You don't have to move the, the, the language from the application. I, I'm just suggesting to you that we're not going to grant you a license that says that. I understand. I, I, I don't I, have a problem with amending the application or anything like I, that. I'm trying to figure out then if, for example, we did not have here listed a um, ballroom dance exhibition if suddenly, uh, if it was not specifically listed in the application, if that meant we could not do that next year. So I'm, I'm well, feeling I think, a little I bit think dance classes on how would we I think dance classes that. would cover that. Dance performances would cover that. I, I think it's possible. I guess my point is that we could come up with something, a magician, <laughs> who would not be specifically listed in, in, the, in the list. So uh, w to be honest, we were a little confounded by the application and just trying to make sure that we, were, we had it right this time because we didn't feel like we had it right last time. So. Okay, so let me just quickly go see if we have anybody uh, in the audience that wants to be heard on this. Vita. Uh, Vita Morris, uh, uh, is the, are we talking about the building that used to be the Swedish church? Yes. Yes. Uh, who who are the owners of it right now? Uh, owners? It's in a non. It's owned by a nonprofit. A nonprofit. It's not a town-owned uh, no. facility. Okay. Um, so then, my other question is: when you start talking about exercises uh, uh, and dancing and what have you. Uh, do you have proper insurance for that kind of thing in case of uh, accidents? Yes, we have. We have. We have insurance. Okay. Yes. Thank you, the, the building is owned by the Yarmouth New Church Preservation Foundation, which was formed in 1998 to preserve the building, which was basically derelict, and has raised about 1.5 million dollars in the last 20 years to bring the building back to being a showcase. Frankly, in the middle of Yarmouth Port, and mm -hmm. our goal now is to try to figure out how to get the building used by as many people in the community as possible who have, among other things, helped to pay for this magnificent restoration. We had almost uh, 300 people come through on a Halloween event that was part of the, around the common historic organizations. I think we had over maybe close to 250 people at the stroll on Sunday. And it's really just wonderful to see this building coming back to life. So we're just trying to figure out mm. how, how to keep that up and, um, yeah, and make it useful. Tell me a little bit about the Halloween event. I'm, I'm familiar with the stroll event. So what was going on inside the building for that? Um, the Halloween event, basically, we're open for trick-or-treating, and we uh, set up a photo section. Um, this year, uh, Carrie Bierce from the Yarmouthport Library was reading stories downstairs. Um, it's an event that is done with all of the historic organizations around the common, including um, the Historic Society of Old Yarmouth, Banks Hallett House, the Gorey House, uh, this year the Yarmouthport Library, the Chapter House, and the Winslow Crocker House all participated. Um, we have a group of volunteers. Uh, families come. They trick or treat among the historic houses. It's really a lot of fun. And it's a great way to get people into these historic buildings mm -hmm. that normally would never dream of going into Thatcher Hall or the Bangs Hallett House. So mm -hmm. it's, uh, but it's not entertainment per se. It's not. Um, there's not a Halloween party, for example, in the building. It's uh, come in, get some candy, take a picture, see the Halloween decorations. We had a skeleton playing the organ. It's a lot of fun. Listen to a story downstairs. Okay. Um, Joyce. Um, I'd just like to congratulate them on a beautiful space, which... I, I know Marianne Agresti has a lot of responsibility for the restoration there. I've gone to concerts there, and everything seems exceptionally well run. Um, and I would have no problem, although I realize there are attorney concerns here, uh, I would have no problem with giving them 
kind of a wide scope because it seems to me that the events that they would have would be likely to be wonderful and very well run. Thank you. Thank you, Joyce. Anyone else? Okay, I'm going to go to the board to see if they have questions or comments, and then we'll come back to you, ladies. Uh, Mark. Uh, thanks, Mr. Chairman. Um, I too want to. Um, I too would like to compliment um, you on the way in which um, this facility is being used, and uh, you know, obviously, the operations, the maintenance, the upkeep. Um, you know, that's a that's a challenge, and. Uh, and, and I commend you for being dedicated to help keep this facility in, 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 in beautiful shape. I've been there. I've, I've, I can see it has enormous potential in terms of serving the community. So I, too, want to applaud you for what you're doing. Um, I, I understand the chairman's concern about um, the description of the notice, but quite frankly, um, I happen to think it was nice to write a hearing advertisement that told the community broadly what you're interested in doing there. So I think to some degree, if there were some issues, it would be helpful to hear from folks in the community about them. You certainly made it very clear what your intentions are. And uh, if there were problems or issues, we would have certainly heard by now. So uh, I'm actually glad that the notice was written as broadly in describing all the kinds of activities that you want to do there. And because there's nobody here complaining or expressing an issue, I think to some degree that, that that's a pretty good indication of community support, at least particularly in this case. Um, so um, I, I'm fully supportive of, 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 of this proposal, and uh, once again, just want to thank you and commend you for all your, all your good work. Thank you. Dan. I don't have any questions. I'm too, I'm supportive. The, the only question I have for Dakota is, do we have a comprehensive list of entertainments that people can just check off? On the application, it kind of is generic in a sense. However, in this case, wouldn't it just fall under public shows and events for the licensing matter? That way, it's a broad, general description to where you can host fitness classes, things like that. Mm. I think that'd be enough to how to word it okay. on the license. With the, um, did you actually get the reception permission the last time you were here? Um, we actually withdrew it, um, right. and we have not been offering wedding receptions in the last few months until we got this, particularly until we got this resolved. Okay. There's, a number, like a there's a number of issues, honestly, with, um, from a practical standpoint that have nothing to do with licensing about wedding receptions in the building, and for right now, we've found it easier just not to do it. Okay. All right. Thank you. So you're not seeking at this point wedding receptions? We're definitely seeking weddings. Right now, we have not oh. been necessarily seeking wedding receptions. And in fact, we have been telling people um, that we were not doing them. We did certainly weren't going to commit to them as long as this was up in the air. Um, we'll see where this goes in the next, but right now, we have not been doing them. See, I'm not against the weddings. The question I'm, I'm asking is, do you need an entertainment license in order to have a wedding there? Reception was our reception understanding. Reception, you do, yeah. Right. So we were offering. But even without an entertainment license, what's to stop them from having a wedding there? The ceremony or the reception? The wet, the ceremony. No, that's fine. But do those in your own home. Right. So, so we're offering just people. Just about anywhere, right? Right. We're offering people the opportunity to do ceremonies there. We're just not offering them the opportunity to do receptions right now. Right. I'm just suggesting to you. I don't think you need a license to do weddings. I, we may not. As a, you need a license to do the reception. Correct. But anyway, we'll go to Dorcas, see what she has to say. I, too, want to commend you on the project there. Yeah, I think that it's been a wonderful um, addition to the community. And it, I've had the pleasure of going inside there and actually seeing what's there with the murals and so forth, and it's just extraordinary. Um, I support absolutely um, you're getting a license here. The only thing I'm a little concerned about is when we were talking on a previous occasion, it was bordering a little close to nightclub, and we want to make sure that we don't have anything that's going to impact you in that respect because, of course, then that changes a lot of things as far as the appearance, what has to be done in the appearance of the building. So. Um, I fully support you right up to where we can. 
Um, and uh, I'll leave it at that. Thank you. Peter. Um, in terms of nightclubs, one of the issues was uh, aisles. There are fixed aisles in the, in the, between the pews. I, I, uh, I, full disclosure, I used to be on the board there. I haven't been on the board for a number of years, but I used to be on the board there. Um, the, none of the neighbors have complained about the noise. In fact, one of the neighbors is here. Uh, sitting in the back, uh, they closed down the music at 10 o'clock, and the music, when we've ha when I, I've been there, have not been able to be heard outside the building. So it's very much contained within the envelope. Um, and I, I brought up the cultural center as, as did you, Mr. Chairman, and I think that the licensing at the cultural center and here should mirror each other because they do a lot of the same things. The cultural center operates 365 days a year. Thatcher Hall probably has probably has 30 to 40, if they're lucky, a year. So it's the intensity of the use of the building is considerably less than the cultural center. And I know the cultural center does weddings. I know they do receptions and all the other items that, that, are, I, that, that are issued. And, yeah. and the million and a half dollars that was, that was put into that building, a lot of it was supported by the, by the town itself from, from funds from here. Uh, and it's one of the most magnificent buildings in the town of Yarmouth and on Cape Cod. I fully support support this, and I fully support Susan and Marianne, who have been on the board and worked very hard for years and years and years, and I, I think it's a great asset for the town. Um, you know, however we can clean up the licensing language, I think is great, but um, I, I, they do need to have a potpourri kind of license because that's, that's what they present. Yeah. I was with you until you used the word potpourri. I'm not <laughs> sure that, that the cultural center deserves that either. But um, other than, I'm trying to work on this language issue, other than the um, Yarmouth Port Stroll and Halloween, are there any more holiday type celebrations that are of that nature, kind of like open to the public that you've described? Um, we do around the common every year, which is done also in conjunction with the other historic properties around the common, uh, which is basically all the historic properties around the common are open for free on usually the first Sunday in September. Um, sometimes there's, there, there's not usually entertainment in the buildings. It's usually just a chance to come in and sort of get it and get a tour. Um, sometimes there's a lecture. You need a license for that. Uh, no, I, I, we didn't. I don't think we anticipated that we needed a license for the open house. For the Halloween, that's why I'm asking these questions. I think you probably would for the Halloween and for the um, the uh, Yarmouth Port stroll. So maybe we could add to the list of events Halloween um, celebration and Yarmouth Port stroll celebration, something to that effect. Would that mean we would Whatever need? Whatever used to, you know, that would be be covered. Would we then need to come back if we decided to do, for example, a Christmas event? Yeah. How about to do what? Culture? Would we have to come back then if we had decided to do, say, a Christmas event that was? Seasonal so I, yeah. I'm. Well, it depends what it is. If it's music, no. If it's dancing, no. If it's singing, no. Okay. Right. Mr. Yeah. Chairman, Mr. Yeah. Chairman, I, totally. I'm going to interrupt you real quickly. The, the all around the common, people come in, leave at Halloween. The people come in, get some candy and leave. And at the, at the Christmas stroll, they come in and get cookies and leave. And listen to music. So, so, so uh, my argument is uh, you, you're trying to strike a difference without a difference. I, just, I, I, I vehemently disagree with that. There is a difference. And they don't come in at the Christmas stroll and leave, because I've been there before. They hang around, they listen to the music, and uh, enjoy, enjoy the facility. Halloween, I've never, I've never been to that, so I can't comment on that. But let's look at, let's look at this language. Um, wedding ceremonies, again, I don't think you need a license for that. Dance performances, fine, in my opinion. <laughs> Comedy shows, fine. Fitness classes, it's okay. Dance classes, 
Open houses, I don't think you need a license for. Um, and then I would probably add to that holiday celebrations. Um, Involving public entertainment. Okay. And that would cover you for the existing two holidays you mentioned and any other holiday, as long as there's an, uh, a public entertainment feature. But you don't, you know, I, I don't think, is anybody disagree with me? I, I don't think to have a, an open house you need a license. I think, Mr. Chairman, I think the, the problem is on our side. I don't think we, we need to, we, I think we need to provide greater clarity to applicants in terms of what an entertainment license really includes. Um, well, I, I think entertainment is the common ordinary use of the word. What is entertainment? <laughs> I understand, but obviously. Do you consider I, this entertainment? I don't. <laughs> Maybe some people do. No, but the point I'm getting at is, is that it's obviously it's not clear to these applicants what's included in an entertainment license. I think the more we can be, we can have a particular definition that goes and it's an ex expansive to include the areas that we think it includes. I think the more we can make that information available uh, to applicants, I think the better off everybody will be. So um, I think I think the problem is our problem. I don't think it's theirs. Uh, see, I'm not, getting, I'm not getting in the problem, and I'm not getting into um, blame laying. I'm trying to get into clarity. What about just open houses providing entertainment? That, that is. Um, excuse me. You, Dakota, earlier you, you used four words that seem to sort of maybe uh, cover sure. everything. You know, again, an open but house is just to expose people to, to the facility. But, yeah. Dakota, yeah. I think it would help to use the words public shows and public events. That way it umbrellas all of these minor events, too. And it leaves it open. So if they want to do a Christmas thing, if they want to do a different holiday, they could do it under the public events slash public shows. Because the entertainment aspect is a public show. They're opening the doors to the public. So therefore, leaving it at that, and then it umbrellas and stems down for all the other fitness classes and things like that. I think is the beneficial way to do it. That way it's all covered. And again, as long as it doesn't trigger the nightclub code requirements. Yeah, if it does they're that, upset. then they're going to have to deal with the building department. Yes. And whatever we understand their that. Um, requirements are. So. I, I think going back to the application, when we wrote the narrative, we weren't necessarily listing these things as items that required an entertainment license as much as trying to educate and explain what the building was being used for right. and then assuming that the board would see what needed to be licensed. Um, I, we, we did find the application a bit confusing, honestly, um, but I'm sure some of that's on us, obviously. But, um, I think there are things listed that I agree with you that probably would not require an entertainment license. I really like Dakota's language, and I would be very curious to know how the Cultural Council is licensed. We actually called them to find out, and the person we talked to did not know. So, <laughs> um, but I, I think we're very similar uh, types of organizations who have taken an old building, restored it, are now using it as a terrific public space, and want the public to use it as much as possible. So Dakota, if we changed it to say Thatcher Hall is keeping their existing license and proposing to include public shows and public events? I don't think we need to rerun the legal ad as we've already sent the legal ad. It's just the licensing description itself is that what we're trying to clarify. Okay, so, so on the ad license. itself, we're okay, yes. and on, it's on the description. Correct. So, for example, I have it right here. On the entertainment, it would say license granted for amplification, live orchestra, music, and then public events, public shows. Okay. So it covers it all. Well, I'd make a motion. Oh, we'd have to close the meeting first. Do we have a motion to close the public portion of the meeting? 
So moved. We have a second? Second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 And I would make a motion um, to approve the license with the amended wording um, as stated by Dakota. Second. I'm just trying to make sure that that covers everything that they want to do. Public shows and events, is that what the language would say? Public shows and events? Yeah. That pretty well covers it. Does that, would that cover somebody renting the building for a private party? Or it's be okay for that? It can still be public. It'll I still don't be. think it, no. I don't need think to get that a is separate. public. A private party is not public. So what would happen if someone wanted to rent a Do you do that? Do you have pub private have parties? have in the past, and we have not done it. Again, we have not done it recently until this was settled. So it would be the same as a wedding reception, in effect, right? Yeah, yeah. So, um, so we got to go further than public shows and events. Um, so the current license is approved for amplification system, which I believe we defined as 60, up to 60 decibels. Yeah. Um, moving picture shows, theatrical exhibition, and then the like orchestra bands and things like that. So I don't know what the private event would include. I it would have to be whatever's already granted. Correct. Right. Right. But if it was, if it was already, if it was something happening, like a somebody had a Birthday party. An art goring, a birthday party, a that the only thing happening was what's already listed in the license. We would be okay. Um, I know that there's been lectures there. There have been divorce parties. <laughs> there have been. There have been. Uh, um, there have been. There have been. There have been a number of number of funerals and and memorial services. Public shows and events. Baby showers. Well, they're gonna, they play recorded music. That's another point. Yeah. It says no recorded music, and it sounds like he, uh, there's there's a lot of these events include playing the music. That's kind of the big thing. Public shows and events, recorded music. If it's private parties and functions, that's sort of a different area too. It's not open to the public. Okay. That should be included. So there's, there's ways of, of having broad categories that cover things, and, and I, I think that the public shows and events, you should look at the recorded music, the other live music is covered, everything's up to 60 decibels. Is it dance class a public show or event? Well, it's not also- I would say no, but, that, but they want that, so I think you gotta add that. A, pu a public show, or a public event is different than instruction, right? A dance class. That's not a public show. What type you of don't go to watch somebody else do dance classes. What type of dance class? Is it like a Zumba class or is it like a private ballet class? That's Zumba classes would be open to the public where a ballet. Well, don't you want to do private classes or no? Well, what we have done in the past is we've, for example, rented to the Cape Symphony for their ballet classes. We've also yeah, done ballet classes. We have done that. We're not doing it right now, but we have done it in the past. We've also done. Uh, we just this year somebody rented it for a night for a tango class. Um, so it's. Uh, yeah, I, I think I, I don't have a problem with public shows and events, but I certainly would add dance classes to that. Because I don't think that's covered by public shows or events. Okay. I just want to make sure they're getting what they're looking for here. Um, dance classes or events. Yeah, I mean, do we need to include then yoga classes, yeah. vocal classes? Would we? Just I mean, I, I, I. No. Or, or, or arts education would that cover it? We have something in here about exercise classes, fitness classes. Exercises and our, our or and or arts education would that work? What is it? Exercise classes, arts education, which might cover a ballet class or a painting class or something like that. Dakota, is it possible to get the cultural yes. centers? I think that might be the easiest thing to to do.
See, dance performances would probably be okay under public shows and events. Comedy shows would probably be okay. And we could add dance classes. We can add fitness classes. Could we say private instruction? Um, and that way we don't have to say every single type of what's taught? But again, I don't, I don't think it matters who's, who the instructor is as long as the dance classes. Right, but does that mean, like, if, if we wanted... A lot of organizations hire someone to do the classes. Is. If we wanted to do a yoga class, would we have to make sure that was listed as well? That's the question. Yeah, I wasn't specifically that a, is That's exercise, isn't it? I, I guess you're right. It's not dance. But, like, one day I ran a printmaking workshop, right? So we have to cover that. So, Dakota, <laughs> what's the verdict? What does it say? Cabaret, concert, dance, dancing by entertainers or performers, dancing by patrons, exhibition, and public show. Do they have a, do they qualify as a nightclub? They are a museum assembly. I believe they're an A3 use, which is the same as Thatcher Hall. So if you had public shows and events, dance classes, fitness classes, you'd probably be you'd probably be covered. Okay. You'd have everything in there you want, plus you could do your special events. So why doesn't somebody make a motion that I will amend my motion to cover those items. Okay, so so the Motion is going to be to allow for, in addition to what's there now, for public shows and events, dance classes and fitness classes. Correct. And, and I think that's everything you're asking us for tonight. Um, I'm not saying that, that that would universally cover anything you might consider later. I don't know. but it, 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 We haven't hit edu education. And as again, Marianne indicated, she did a printmaking print making class. And I know at the Cultural Center they do painting classes. Cooking. Live cook, live, live art. Those aren't entertainment uses. I, I, I think, oh, okay. you know, that's, that's the thing. You can, do, you can do a cooking class. You can do an art class. <coughs> right. You don't need an entertainment That's license. not entertainment. But the public show that you wind up after you do your rehearsal, that's entertainment. Thank you. That's really helpful. Yeah. Which, which kind of goes back to Mark's helpful comment that you know we we don't what is entertainment? Yeah. <laughs> so that's, yeah. Well, yeah. I mean, I, I I'm serious. I think if if you did legal research, you could you could make a career out of it. <laughs> you know, what, what, and there'd always be that one thing that's kind of on the cusp or a hybrid thing. I mean, a sadomasochist can say, I consider, you know, self, self infliction of this uh, entertainment. The crazy individual probably does. But it, is that included in a common understanding of the word? You know what I mean? You can debate these things forever, but I think, I think with Dakota's suggestion, public shows and events, pretty broad. Great. And they are, and they are distinct from private events that the public can't, cannot attend. In addition to that, just to be safe, we've added with Dorcas's um, revised motion dance classes, just to be sure, and fitness classes. And I'm looking at the only thing you don't have here is, is wedding receptions, but you said you're not seeking that right now. Right now, we're not doing them. I mean, I'm sorry, what? We need the, yeah, I mean, we, we, we postponed them because we wanted to be right. respectful of this process. But, but it doesn't mean that we don't want to have Yeah, we would like, right. we would like to get back to it. But didn't that then come into the parameters of nightclub? Potentially yeah, that triggers could potentially nightclub. Trigger it does that. not yeah. have no, to. I think that was a oh. big problem. I think one of the qu our questions was if it was fewer than 50 people, then it would not trigger the nightclub. Is no. that true or not? No, I don't no. think it okay. is. But, all right, but that's one reason we backed off was because we did not want to trigger the nightclub designation. 
No, I, I, I want to be so clear. I, think, I want to be think, clear. It's it's perfectly possible to have a wedding reception without triggering the nightclub. I think we've covered, and in those hours, Dorcas would be from nine to ten. It triggers the nightclub. Yeah. No, it's perfectly possible to have one without triggering the nightclub. Nightclub is about low lights, nighttime activity, above um, acoustic music over sixty decibels, table and seating that has ill-defined aisles. So, in number in, of people. Um, so if you have it over 50, there's, there's, um, you know, a different requirement for protection, but frankly, it's a list of these six things. And if you trigger two of them, you're a nightclub, but if you don't trigger them, you can have a reception and you're perfectly fine. So the music's a factor too. Yes. Above 60 it's decibels. There's got to be an automatic triggering. If there's a fire that that alarm, that that music is basically shut down and the alarm is, is triggered because. I would like with that over at the senior center now. It's very specific in the building code that if you trigger two of these items, low light levels, music generated above 60 decibels, nighttime operating hours, tables and seating that creates ill-defined aisles, specific area for dancing and serving um, right. uh, beverages only. You have to trigger two of those to be a nightclub. Right. We can have an afternoon wedding reception without low light levels with acoustic music at 60 double syllables only. You know, so my point is, I think we should add wedding receptions to the license and let it be a building department issue, as it would for any event, that um, if, and this is what Mark has said, that he would review them on a case-by-case -case basis. So, I mean, well, for instance, you could have a concert that also could be interpreted in this way if you kind of open up a big dance floor. So I don't think we should isolate wedding receptions as an issue. And Mr. Chairman, I will amend my motion to include wedding receptions. And then leave it to the building department to determine if it's a nightclub issue or not. The only thing now I'm, I'm a little concerned about is whether we're going to remain within the scope of the, of the legal ad. I, don't, I think we're getting away from that. And so I'd have some concerns about that, that the public's not on notice, given the um, the way the ad is is phrased. I'd be a little reluctant. Even though it says wedding wedding ceremonies in the public ad. Well, uh, wedding ceremony and reception is night and day, really. I'll second that. Let's <laughs> vote on it. You want to add that? Mm -hmm. Yeah, let's. You want to add wedding receptions? Okay. You're going to add wedding receptions? Okay. Okay. Are we done? We're done. Okay. All those in favor? I, 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 oh, wait, Peter's oh, got oh, something. I, Hurry up, Peter. Right. Um, have we covered rentals to third parties? Because that was questioned as well. That doesn't come into this. Doesn't come into it. Doesn't come, doesn't come into it. Arrangement that business. You know that that's. Don't need to worry about it, no. Dakota. No, because the the establishment is licensed for the address. Right. Okay. So. Okay. Okay. Fantastic. Premises that are licensed. Right. Okay. I would withdraw my comment then. Okay. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. All those opposed, no. I'm going to vote no only because I'm, I have concern about the scope of the legal ad on the wedding receptions. So I'm going to vote only for that reason. Otherwise, I'm fully supportive of it. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank, Thank you. you very much. Hope you all come to an event sometime. Absolutely. Okay. Back to the computer. Let's see what else we have here. Solar Wolf. We got to get a new name for that. Solar Wolf. Um, energy update. Reminds me of the Wolf of Wall Street. Remember that movie? And so we have here. Bill Scott's going to take this one. Yes, Mr. Chairman. Okay. Uh, Bill Scott, uh, Assistant Town Administrator. 
Uh, Joyce Flynn is also here from the Energy Committee. You should have a memorandum in front of you December 5th, 2023. Uh, the program is now the Yarmouth Assistance Program uh, based on the contract that the board signed on October 17th. Uh, what we've outlined here is sort of some of the products or deliverables that we're working on with Mass CEC, uh, the Clean Energy Center. Uh, the original uh, agency in terms of the uh, Solar Wolf and the Solarize program. Um, so what we're looking at is, you know, we want to make sure that we have the correct client data, what the status is, where their permits are. So we're building a database in that regard so that as we move forward, <clears throat> we know who's ready to proceed and who might need some more time to move forward. The other thing we're working on is sort of uh, FAQs, uh, you know, through uh, Joyce's organization, uh, Joyce Flynn. Uh, she's had, a, you know, a lot of questions over time, and we want to package those that would go to the clients, per se, and then uh, frequently asked questions is a good way for them to ask even sub-questions to those or additional questions. And by virtue of that, we would disseminate them to the program participants. Mass CEC is working on a program manual that is with Sun Power. Sun Power is the uh, company that is willing to help uh, solve this problem by virtue of providing materials and uh, work uh, on homes or households that haven't had the work finished or started where deposits were taken. So Mass CEC is still working with Sun Power to that extent on a contract, so we can't tell you the exact nature of their contract or their starting date or the manual, but <clears throat> it's something that they're working on right now. Implementation outreach, we believe that once we have the FAQs, the client data, uh, and then the manual done, that we will hold a meeting. So by the time we get to that meeting, people will be fully aware of what the programmatic uh, approach is in this, and uh, last, uh, the schedule for implementation. The key to this is we want to make sure that we're very comprehensive and we don't give people expectations that are beyond the program, but also uh, that they understand what their obligations are and, and what some power of Mass CC's obligations are. The original program description is on the reverse side. This is the one that uh, we brought to the board on October 17th with the contract. That hasn't changed, uh, basically, and uh, Mass CEC uh, was a help in actually writing a, a lot of this to make sure that it was clear as to what Sun Power's role is going to be and their role is going to be. Uh, so we have the contract signed back from Mass CEC, the one that the board authorized the execution of. And uh, so we're proceeding with them, and they are proceeding with some power. We do not have a relationship, we as in the town, with some power, uh, but they will set up relationships with each program participant directly. Uh, our goal is to make sure we have the correct client data, that all the questions are answered, and that as we go through developing the program manual, that we incorporate a lot of that information. So we believe that the best way to do this is by the time we get to the public meeting, everybody's aware of what's behind us, and then we educate them as to what's in front of us. So the new name is the Yarmouth Assistance Program, or YAP. <laughs> so Great anacronym. There you go. CC's choice, I think. Any questions by the board? And we'll, uh, through uh, Joyce, we will we'll send out this memorandum. Uh, she was kind enough to send the entire package that we had the last time, uh, which brought forth some questions from the newspaper and then a newspaper article and also some questions from participants. But our goal is to try to get as much of those, even the anomalies, uh, sort of collected so that we can answer as many questions as we can before we proceed. Mr. Chairman, if I could ask a question. Yes, Peter. Right. On the on the back page, the second to the last paragraph, only eligible residents who meet participation requirements are eligible to participate. Participants in the program will only be responsible for the balance of the costs they contract for with Solar Wolf. I talked to them and they wanted ninety percent up front. Does that mean that Solar uh, Solar Wolf is only going to come up with the additional ten percent? Because, no, no, the, because the, I've already uh, paid 90%? Uh, 
No, they're, they're basically participants in a program will only be responsible, the program participants, for the cost of the system they contracted for solar. We, uh, my understanding is Sun Power is going to install based on what was deposited with uh, Solar Wolf. So if a person put a deposit down and didn't either get installation or panels, then we're bringing to the table installation or panels. But I don't have the program manual in front of us, and I will get clarity for the board on what that sentence means. That the, probably the bottom of this is really mass CEC language. You know, uh, so the balance of the system, that is the amount unpaid, I believe, the person would be responsible for. So if you paid $30,000 for a system, uh, no, uh, $25,000 for a system and 5000 was on the table, my understanding is some power is going to cover the installation through uh, personnel and materials and not necessarily cash. But to your point, I will make sure we understand what that specific uh, sentence means. Great, and, and again, what I just described is what's been described to me, but I need to see the project manual and the contract with some power before I tell you that's exactly what's happening. I mean, so, it, it, yeah, it, it looks good that things are moving forward. It's just, it's just it was hard for me to understand exactly what that sent, that paragraph meant. Right, and, and, and I think that it's important that as we do this, we, um, we want to use the FAQ system and, and then the public meeting as a means to engage everybody at once, as it were, because as we get individual questions, we don't want the sort of expectations and program changing. So trying to get these materials done, getting them done with Mass CEC so that we know exactly what they're going to be bringing to the table with some power, I think is the most important thing we can do. So we're going to be working on the client data and questions and responses with uh, Mass CEC. But again, uh, we'll determine what exactly that sentence means. I don't know if you have anything to add. Yeah, I was just going to add um, to what Peter was asking. Um, we have customers who uh, have paid $500 for their installation because at a point, uh, $500 is a down payment. They were getting it for that um, because there were so many headaches in the bad old days with the Old Kings Highway historical permits. Um, that it was felt that we just couldn't ask people to put up the 30%. Um, so the, I believe there are two who have $500 down. Um, the usual amount that people would have down would be 30%, and the payment structure was 30% on contract signing, then 30% um, um, at the time of permitting, 30% at the time of installation, and then 10% at the commissioning stage, which is the stage uh, uh, when you're net metered. Um, and that depends a little on Eversource's schedule. So that's not under the control of anyone else. Joyce, thank you. Oh, glad you. Mr. Sherman, can I just? Sure. I just really want to thank you, you and your committee and staff. You've been dogged in protecting the citizens that were negatively impacted by this issue. This was a great program. It really was, and it was a real uh, effort to expand solar energy in the town. It had all the right elements. Just, it just had a wolf at the door. Wolf at the door, and you didn't let him win. And you know, I, I think you know this board and the town citizens are just so grateful for the amount of effort that you've put into making everybody whole. It's been wonderful. Thank you. We just didn't want to let something that was meant to make the town better, to, to bring community together and remove emissions from the planet, to, to end worse than we started. I mean, it was unthinkable. So uh, we had to. I think we all say thank you to you, Joyce, for the hard work that you put into this. Uh, thank Thanks. you. Yeah, and I echo those sentiments, and I'll add what I said before. This is a highly unusual result coming out of a, a bankruptcy situation. In fact, I've never heard of it before. Um, generally, you get a filing like this, and the customers get nothing. And, um, and to, 
far as I understand the resolution of this, they're going to be pretty much made whole. And that, that, that is an incredible, absolutely incredible outcome. And we're delighted because um, there are dozens of other um, Solar Wolf customers, separate from Solarize Yarmouth, which was only for Yarmouth residents and right. Yarmouth staff, um, who will not be helped. So if they're in Massachusetts, they can get up to a certain amount from the Home Improvement Contractor Guarantee Fund, probably a maximum of nine or 10,000. But otherwise, um, they're really stuck. That's and I if feel they exhaust I all kinds of collection that, efforts, that. right? That yes, they have to go yes. through first. So they have to do quite a bit of work to be eligible for that fund. And now that Solar Wolf is totally gone with the bankruptcy, I think that will that will provide clarity for their situation. But yes, it's 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 really tough on them. I feel very sad when our newsletter goes out to them because so many other people have asked to be on the list because I'm always announcing something that's wonderful for Yarmouth and maybe a little bit of help mm. for, for Shrewsbury. Mm. Mr. Chairman. Yes, Mark. Yeah, I, I also, while kudo, kudos are being passed around, I also want to uh, add you to the list of uh, people that have been incredibly helpful, as well as Bob Rittenauer, our town administrator, and Bill, our assistant. I think um, this has been one of those issues where I think we've all been outraged over the way this has been handled. And I think um, this kind of teamwork uh, involving, and again, I, I, have to, I have to give kudos to the town administrator. Uh, in the meetings that I participated in with the state officials, um, you know, Mr. Chairman, you were there uh, raising holy hell and making it very, very clear that you wanted to see things taken care of. So, you know, it's a really across the board. And also our state reps, Yes. Uh, you know, they, they, they stood tall with us as well. So it's good to be able to count on that political support when we ask for it, they're there to step up. So, you know, Representative Flanagan, he, you know, he stepped in and he's been, a, he's been a big help in this. And I want to just give a shout out to him as well. This is one of those things where everybody came together and pushed yeah. really hard together. And uh, we've finally been able to do something to help make this right for people here that have been really been impacted. So. I just wanted to add a few other folks that yes. should not, their efforts should not be forgotten because every time I brought it up with Bob, he was clearly, um, you know, front and center and uh, very engaged in this effort. He did not let a, mo a moment drop without being involved. So thank you. Thank you, Mark. Anyone else? Just, uh, Mr. Chairman, I also like to echo thanks to Joyce. She's like the program savant. She's uh, able to get um, myself to a position where we're way ahead of the game in terms of the amount of knowledge she has and uh, and all the questions that have come out of this. I mean, Joyce has been there, very helpful to move us forward. So, thank you. You're welcome. Thank you. No well-deserved comments, Joyce. Thank you very much. Thank you. Okay. Yes, we good? Yep. Thanks, George. <laughs> Next, we have a update on the housing production plan. What's this? Oh, yeah, I've seen that, yeah, okay. Hello. Oh, I've learned a lot tonight. <laughs> Good evening. About licensing. My club oh, regulations. Yeah. We're ready. All right, great. So good evening. Just for the record, uh, my name is Mary Wagen. I'm the town's affordable housing program administrator. And we're here tonight uh, regarding the town housing production plan. I'm joined by members of the community housing committee. Drew Kraus, who's our vice, who is the vice chair. Lee Hamilton and Masha Bissell. And also, that would help. Thank you. <laughs> um, and also uh, our director of community development, Karen Green. 
So we met with you last in August and reviewed the housing production plan and we took your thoughtful comments from that meeting and incorporated them all into the plan. Um, you can see um, the second page of our cover memo to you tonight um, documents where those changes were incorporated. Um, hope we got the headings right, but everything that you guys said is now in the plan. Um, most of your comments resulted in additions to the plan, um, except for one item. Hearing the comments about the proposed development at Forest Road, um, that item has been completely removed from the housing production plan. Um, and then just as a quick reminder and for people that didn't tune in in August, um, you know, what is a housing production plan? Well, this housing production plan is a five-year strategic plan to help the town meet its housing needs. On a very high level, that means creating and preserving housing to keep young people here um, in Yarmouth, to keep older residents safely housed, and to provide housing that residents can afford. Per the plan, the housing needs um, that are a priority for this town are year-round rentals, starter homes, housing rehabilitation, eviction prevention, and support of households with special needs. Um, housing strategies to meet these needs are zoning. These are the techniques you can, you can use to meet these needs. Zoning, building capacity of the affordable housing program, creating more units, building more brick and mortar units, and also preserving your existing units. So that's a real quick summary. It's almost like the table of contents of the plan. Um, so anyways, with that, um, I, we would welcome any questions that you have about um, the amended plan. Okay. Um, <clears throat> I know that Mark um, has recently been on the radio talking about county initiatives, uh, on a pilot program, and um, actually uh, extending some very high compliments to the people in this town involved in, in housing. So I'm going to start with Mark. <laughs> Thanks, Mr. Chairman, and um, that's true. I'm, I'm very proud of uh, the people uh, that work here in Town Hall that work very hard, particularly on this topic, and uh, that includes the committee members that spend a lot of time and energy on this as well. Um, uh, I'm very fortunate as a selectman to have, you know, you know, your resources, your talents, your energies really devoted to this, and I was very, uh, I was not uh, shy in boasting about how proud we are as an entire board uh, for the work that you do in this. And we did this at the governor's press conference when she made a major announcement about this housing bill. Mm -hmm. And uh, I also gave a, an extra shout out to, to Mary Wagan because um, of all the hard work that she does. She's tireless on this. And she provides support to you and other committees. She provides support to us. And she's dogged on the Affordable Housing Trust. And uh, we are, uh, we would be, I'd hate to think what, how the world would be like here in this town without you continuing to do all the great work that you do. Um, I want to thank you for taking our comments to heart. Um, you did, and uh, I think the document is, is more reflective, I think, of the sort of where we're at and what we need to do. And I also think, um, you know, it's kind of sad about the Forest Road development, the way that's all played out and the way that controversy seems to be building. But I think the document needs to be accurate in terms of where we all stand as a community on that. The reality was there was a, t there was a town meeting vote and, uh, you know, we need to make sure that, uh, that, that we're much more accurate in terms, of, um, in terms of that project. So I think you've done that. Um, so really, I want to just thank you uh, for getting it all right. And, um, and now the tough part is, is you know, once, once we get this approved by the board, then the next job is focused on implementing it, mm -hmm. and uh, we've got we've got a, we've got hard work ahead of us. Um, you know, my hope is that you know we'll see some real success, you know, at the state house in terms of creating more resources and incentives to stimulate the market. Um, and one of the things that we've talked about, Mr. Chairman, on the the affordable housing trust is spending some other time sort of focused on some of the some of the specific developments and market trends that may be constraining our supply of affordable housing, and that is particularly taking a harder look at the housing market in Yarmouth and looking at a much closer detailed assessment as to 
what's happening uh, in the Airbnb market, to what degree is that impacting us, and we may want to look at other trends as well, particularly lately there have been numerous reports about investor-owned housing and how investors are really coming into regions like Cape Cod and scooping up a lot of housing. So I think what we need to do is to perhaps bring in other resources and other experts to help us keep track of some of the trends that are underway that are making our lives a bit more complicated right. and making it more difficult to sustain affordable housing. Because I feel like while we're making strides, I feel sometimes we're sort of um, you know, swimming upstream and sometimes the water is coming at us a lot faster than maybe what we can handle. Right. So um, you, right. know, you know, I think we've got to figure out how, how we basically assess what's going on in the market and then look at other towns in terms of what they're doing uh, in, as, in terms of successful strategies for dealing with some of these trends because um, there clearly are other communities that are adopting strategies to deal with some of these other pressures. They're taking initiatives and I think it would be it would behoove us to um, really not pay close attention to what other communities are doing and addressing some of these other factors as well. So I think you're all doing a great job um, and uh, uh, I look forward to working with you as this plan gets uh, gets implemented and uh, we move forward in Yarmouth. Thank you. Thank you, Mark. Dan. Um, I agree with many of Mark's sentiments. Um, I had a real good opportunity to look at the plan this time through. Um, it provides a really wonderful explanation of where we are now as a town and particularly how we got here. Um, What's harder, of course, is where do we go from here? And that goes to Mark's point about, you know, making sure that we actually do something with this plan. Um, I love the idea of the education. I think that's absolutely imperative because the ideas of affordable housing vary from group to group to group, including this group. You know, um, I think it's important to educate uh, all of our committees and uh, the volunteers in the town uh, so that we're all working from the same page. And that doesn't seem to be the case um, oftentimes with housing. Um, what's clear is we have to do something because what is currently existing and the efforts that we made over the last 20 years just haven't seemed to be able to make a, a significant dent. If anything, we have exacerbated some of the issues. And not due to our efforts, just market conditions and other forces that are at play. But um, the housing situation is untenable um, in many respects uh, in the town. So I'm, I'm very happy we've got a very comprehensive, detailed plan. Um, looking toward the end of the uh, plan, I was particularly appreciative of um, some of your action items, because mm -hmm. that's really what I was looking for, is um, how do we hit the road? You talked about an, a property inventory, and I thought that's great, because it seems to be the one thing that's been missing in terms of, you know, where do we want affordable housing? What kind of housing do we want, first of all, but what particular group do we want to work on? Can we, can we work on elderly? Can we work on veterans? Can we work on um, all the various types of housing at the same time, or do we have to focus or split off? I don't know. But we usually rotate through. <laughs> right, and I'm not sure that's working. Well, what, what happens is you, you, you satisfy a need for like affordable rental housing. And then if you pull something, if you do something that too quick, more affordable rental housing, your local residents mm -hmm. have already, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. So then we go to home ownership, you know what I mean? And then we do some housing services, and then we go back to rental. So we kind of, we, we, we you know, people call me all the time, and they describe what kind of housing that they need. So we, we, we balance that. Um, I, yeah, I appreciate that sentiment of, of balance, and I, I, I absolutely hear you, and I, uh, people do get tired of, you know, we just did two big developments on 28. What are we doing here? Uh, cool it. Look at something else. Look at elderly, uh, which we haven't done a lot with, uh, mm -hmm. to be fair. Um, Hopefully with the, the housing bond bill, yeah. there's more money for that. So, I don't have um, a lot of confidence in the state these days. Oh, really? <laughs> I'm gonna, we're going to figure out how to get access to the money from the housing bond bill. Right. And, um, However, um, 
one of the other things that the um, that the report mentioned quite a bit, and I'm just one person, but I think we need some clarity because many of the recommendations that we, you were talking about were talking about revitalizing commercial areas mm -hmm. with um, sustainable uh, infrastructure, and we know what you're talking about. We're talking about 28. We're talking about revitalizing motels, and to my view, at least, that in some ways is at cross purposes well with what we're trying to achieve with the soaring project and commercial redevelopment. And I'm not sure that we're all on the same page on that. And I think that needs more discussion and more. Um, I think you know we just got that we just got that hundred thousand dollar housing choice award from the state. Mm -hmm. And I think that's what we're going to depend on to, um, to make that happen. Okay. And I don't know if Karen wants to um, talk a little bit, because Karen wrote the grant <laughs> with assistance from Bill, right? And um, yeah, well, hopefully that will address some of your concerns, Dan, because the focus of the grant is to get help to build on our VCOD, our Village Centers Overlay District, where we have, you know, the um, the bones for the mixed use that the planning board and the town envision yep. happening on Route 28. The issue that we've had is really incentivizing that type of development, and we've had some projects that end up all housing rather than mixed use uh, with a commercial component to complement our commercial corridor as well as housing to provide those built-in customers and and whatnot. So um, we'll be working on that grant conjunctively with some other economic development analysis, and I think it all really complements the efforts of the housing production plan at the same time. Okay. So it's on page 85, 84 and 85, if you want to, you know, just I, I, yeah, look I, at that really I, I carefully and get involved, because we will need we will need solid public participation for that. I think it's good. It's a good step. Um, I just think that there needs to be a lot more discussion and consensus uh, in terms of where we're going. And what's um, a good fit on 28 and what isn't. And um, maybe we can do both. Maybe we can do revitalization of our economic tax base and do some inventive um, housing on 28 as well. Um, but if, you know, I, I look at that laundry site and that gives me real pause. And I'm just afraid that, you know, many of the inferences that are in the report could, could be a welcome to Yarmouth sign for any 40B developers. Um, I'm concerned about what all this money we're pouring into 28 and I just want to make sure that um, we are clear about you know, what the priorities are and what's acceptable, what isn't. And I'm not sure that we're all in agreement on that. I'll just leave it there. This, uh, however, is a major work by all of you, and I appreciate the work that went in, the detail that went into it. Uh, I'll be candid, my eyes glazed over at times. There's so much detail. And, the, you know, there's just so many facets to it. Um, that's why it's so complex and education is needed for all of us so that, you know, we can move forward and address these issues significantly with some impact rather than just putting band-aids on them, you know, until the next round comes around. But I'm very appreciative of the work and I'm supportive of the plan and I really um, learned a lot and I thank you all for that. Thank you, Dan. Dorcas. Well, I'm still reading it, <laughs> quite honestly, and studying it. Uh, I think that you've done a tremendous job. I think that this document is um, very well detailed. Uh, it has a lot of background information about the town that I found very informative, um, and that you have set forth some of the action plans that we need to do going forward. I support everything that both um, our select board members, Mark Forrest and Dan Horgan, have said, and I underscore them as well. I, I think the next step is for us to go forward, implement it, and um, actually approve it, and then start the implementation process and the education process. 
Um, we, we saw how well that worked with um, the wastewater, and I think we can do it with housing, too. And I thank you very much. And I think we've had a tremendous team that's been working on it. Thank you. Thank you, Dorcas. Yeah. The, the, the detail and the detail and the detail was, was amazing. Um, and, and it boils down to what I see is three things, land, infill, septic, septic, oh, excuse me, I mean sewer system. Because <laughs> none of this is really gonna happen Given given what you've outlined in in the plan with the nitrogen loading and stuff until we get a sewer system in place now We we did get some good news that we've got some of the contracts signed Though the letter that we got from the DEP was kind of vague and hard to understand exactly what they were saying um, it, But it, it, it was it was amazing and you talked about tiny houses you you hit on every everything that I, I could ever think of and things that I never thought of um, cost to build right now, a basic home, 300 to $350 a square foot before land, which makes it real expensive. Um, and I'm going to ask about Forest Road. Forest Road is crossed off. What does that mean? Does that mean it's gone forever? It's gone for the time being? It's, you're going to donate it back to the town? What are you so going to do with it? So this is a plan, right? right? Um, it doesn't prohibit any uh, development. For affordable housing in town something that's in this plan doesn't it doesn't mean that this guarantees that it will happen so um, the concerns raised about Forest Road were starting to get pretty technical mm -hmm. um, about water groundwater protection well water protection so those wouldn't we couldn't deal address those in the HPP I, I, I agree I agree but so but, but again much a higher level right. so the review of that of that proposed development is most likely going to happen when an application goes into the zoning board of appeals. Very good, excellent. Again, the 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 detail and stuff was wonderful, and and the the work that went into it clearly was clearly was tough. One uh, one quick one quick question. This this may be above your pay grade as well. Um, one of the public comments that came in tonight was was there was a, a homeless person who was looking for a place to live. Is there a list of folks that have that are waiting for a place to live? Do they put them in shelters or do they just wander the streets? So, um, which was which Kate, was which was the implication that the person made is that this person is just left on on her own again, and this may be above your bailiwick. To that that nice lady who was trying to help this poor soul, and I gave her uh, two uh, phone numbers um, that you can enter into the shelter system. So, um, the state came down about maybe five or six years ago. We have a, we, I'm a member representing the town on the regional network to address homelessness. And the state came down, because we had so many isolated, scattered sites that were sheltering people. They came down and said, oh, you need a, co what they call a coordinated entry system, where anybody who needs to be sheltered, there's several entry points on the Cape, one of them is Housing Assistance Corporation, one of them is the Department of Transitional Assistance, where people can contact them and get sheltered. Um, it, 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 there can be a wait list if you're an individual because of the right to shelter provisions of state statute. If you have minors in your family, if children in your family, you will get sheltered. You get sheltered quicker than if you're individuals. So um, it, 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 it seems, it sounded, when I talked to that lady afterwards, it sounded like some activity happened. Um, but I, I did give her my card, my, my uh, business card, and two good phone numbers on how to enter into the system. Um, I think there's also ways um, that the police department can help. And um, I'll, I'll, I'll check in with them. Um, right. Again, th thank you. This, this is kind of outside of outside of the yeah. agenda, but but I get. I want to thank you very much for right. the information. And Mary, you've done a terrific job, and the rest of your committee has done a terrific job as well. Again, thank you. I was just on a I was just on a lecture. Harvard University is doing all these housing lectures on Friday, and you know, there's just this big book out that's shaking everything up. It, homelessness is caused because of a lack of housing units. 
period. <laughs> Not all these other things. It's no housing units. So we used to, you know, the affordable housing programs used to be called, you know, homelessness prevention programs. And then, the, you know what I mean? So it's all, it's, when we are talking about this, we are talking about addressing homelessness. Thank you, Peter, for bringing that up. Thank you, Peter. Um, this is a very multiplex problem, and um, hearkening to what Dorcas said, I think, you know, in terms of implementation, there's going to have to be a big educational piece. Mm -hmm. There's going to have to be a lot of debate, a lot of understanding, a lot of prioritization. As you said, you try to kind of uh, rotate the service to the need, you know, to eventually cover everything. Um, there's a lot of value judgments, I'm sure, that are going to come into play. Um, but there's a lot of good statistical information in here about um, um, the, the amount of income a lot of the people who have housing are paying, some of them up to 50 percent, which is really frightening because as you're, as you're trying on the one hand to service more people, you're saying to yourself, how long can these people sustain themselves in this kind of, a, of an economic situation? Probably not forever. I mean, think about that. Think about taking, mm -hmm. assume you pay taxes, <laughs> and, and who knows? I mean, how much of a priority that'll be if, if it comes down and you got kids and you, you, you know, you're trying to keep the lights on and the heat on, and, but assume your net income, whatever it is, and half of that goes goes to housing. Um, and then you get the car, you get the gasoline, you got repairs. I mean, somebody walks and says, "Oh, you need brakes." That's only eleven hundred bucks front and rear brake. Where's that money going to come from? You don't have it. It's not there. Um, it's a desperate situation that a lot of these people are living in that have housing. So you're wondering how long they can sustain that, and and that that's another layer of the problem. So it's, um, it's a very, very difficult situation, and I appreciate, as my colleagues have all stated, the amount of work and effort that you're putting into addressing these situations. Um, I'm very, the page references that you cited, I went to um, on, on the computer screen, uh, I think they were was 85, 86, uh, they should be read, and, and they're, they're, very, they're very good talking about the infrastructure that we need, the mixed use, um, the zoning issues, um, aesthetics um, for doing mixed, I, I, I think there's big uh, opportunity in, in, in mixed use housing, and we, we've never been able to really do it on any kind of a sustainable basis yet in town, but the studies that have recommended that and promoted that are not new. They've, they've been around a very, very, very long time. Um, when you look at other towns that have village centers like Hyannis and Dennis Port, or you go up to Plymouth, Mm -hmm. You realize the word that they used about how Yarmouth was laid out in our commercial district and the word, as I recall, that they used in these bluestone studies and studies like that was sprawl. And that is the perfect word because that's exactly what it is. So hopefully, in addition to addressing housing needs, you're going to get um, some economic vibrancy mm -hmm. as well. Um, that we can we can start to see on Route 28. So thank you so much. So, um, Mr. That? Chairman, I'd like to make a motion. Yes. That we. Oh yeah. Because the, this goes back to the planning board. So. I understand. I did see that motion floating around here somewhere. So, Mr. Chair, I'd like to make a motion to approve the housing production plan dated November 2023 as presented to this Board of Selectmen on the condition that the Planning Board likewise approves the plan. 
Second. Okay, we have a motion and a second to approve subject to. Why, why, why are we conditioned on planning? So <laughs> here's the steps, right? It, it comes from the housing committee, right? It goes to the planning board. Then it comes to you. Oh, okay, we skipped one. Yeah, and just just because there's been significant updates, especially with respect to zoning, I'd like to bring it back to the planning board and make sure we get an affirmative vote for them. And then when we then we send it up to the state for approval. Okay. Second. If somebody didn't. We have a second. Okay. And we have a third. No. <laughs> Which is better than a second. Okay, all those in favor? Aye. 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 Anyone opposed? Passes unanimously. Thank you. Great. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> we are now on board and committee actions. At the written paper sure sure may yeah yeah no i think i think we're going to need a couple of written copies as we go at least one for the chairman <laughs> <laughs> the chairman how about for this select board member as well all right here we go yeah I, i'll get this eventually but i'm going to probably be one of the last ones that do it's hard for me to keep switching forward and backwards and I, and this computer, um, they just got me going for tonight. He says, oh, you're supposed to bring it in like once a month or so. Have you bring yours in for updates? I don't. Nobody ever told me Say that. Say it again. <laughs> bring what in? They say you're supposed to bring your computers in you for updates periodically. No, I, I don't. You, I, I don't. I update mine, mine I tried it this afternoon. Everything worked. I get here, nothing works. So story of my life. <laughs> so yeah, I'm going to leave there it. There is here. a way to get them automatically updated. I'm going to leave it here, and they're going to hopefully do whatever they have to do to it. Using the paper, then, Mr. Chairman, <laughs> I'd yes. like to say. By all means. Uh, I move um, that we accept the resignation of Kathy McPhee with thanks from the um, Age-Friendly Committee. Okay. Second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Anyone opposed? Passes unanimously. I move that we accept the appointment of uh, Joanne Mazzola as a regular member of the Age Friendly Committee. This appointment is for a two-year unexpired term, which will run through February of 2025. Do second? Second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Anyone opposed? Passes unanimously. Um, I move that we reappoint John Stewart as an alternate member of the Old Kings Highway Committee. This appointment is for a one-year term, which will run through December of 2024. Second. Okay, all those in favor? Aye. 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 Anyone opposed? Passes unanimously. And um, I move that we uh, reappoint Julian Mallett and uh, Ellie Lawrence as regular members of the Waterways and Shellfish Advisory Committee. These terms are for three years and will run through December of 2026. Second. I have a motion and a second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Anyone opposed? Passes unanimously. Move to reappoint Bob Churchill and uh, Rick Crawford as regular members of the Waterways and Shellfish Advisory Committee. These terms are for two years and will run through December of 2025. S second. I have a motion and a second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Anyone opposed? Passes unanimously. I move to reappoint Al Keller as regular member of the Waterways and Shellfish Advisory Committee. This term is for one year and will run through December of 2024. Second. Okay, I have a motion and a second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Anyone opposed? Passes unanimously. I move to um, reappoint Jesse Agopian uh, for a one-year term expiring in 2024 as an alternate to the Waterways and Shellfish Advisory Committee. Second. Okay, we have a motion, second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Anyone opposed? Passes unanimously. I move to reappoint John Stewart for a one-year term as alternate 
to the Waterways and Shellfish Advisory Committee, um, this term expiring in December of 2024. Second. I have a motion and a second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Anyone opposed? Passage unanimously. And I think that's it. That's it? I think. Wait a second. That's it. Last one was John, right? John Stewart. Mm -hmm. You're all set. You can get them all. Mm -hmm. All right. So now we go to town administrator items. No, we don't. We go to agenda review. What's hiding down there is number four. And, um, I know um, at our last meeting, we didn't have very much on the agenda, and uh, thanks to Mark um, kind of helping us out with some p potential uh, matters that we could address, two of which we addressed tonight, Solar Wolf and the Housing Production Plan, we were able to kind of orient the um, the agenda and Bob and I had a little discussion about that, and we were saying, you know, wondering how we could be a little bit more organized, a little bit more systematic, a little bit more um, evenly scheduled on some of these issues. And we were thinking about trying to gear, at least in part, the agenda to certain performance. Um, time periods of, of, of various departments and then have them come in and report how they're doing on these, on these, um, what's the thing I want to work, performance, mm -hmm. on these performance um, targets. Uh, you want to talk a little bit about that, Bob? Sure, I'd love to. And, um, you know, first of all, thanks to, to Mark, too, for, um, you know, we were looking at the, coming agenda items and they were really quite you know sparse during the month of, of December so we were able to you know jump in and, and put a, a bunch of those things forward and um, I, I, I think what, what we'd like to do moving into January is to take a real strategic look at some of the critical projects that we have that have been outstanding the goals of the Board of Selectmen um, all of the things that have been in the mix involve the staff and we've been doing this already and identifying some critical milestones that you know that are, are coming up that are elements of these projects that need to have some progress and to um, fill out uh, early in this year uh, a much more I'd say borrow Mark's term again robust right, kind of upcoming agenda that's geared towards the specific items so that you know we can fill in the side stuff as we go but that we have so that the board can count on it staff members can count on it uh, and Bill and I were talking about this from a project management standpoint. It would really help us, too, to be able to, you know, have folks know that, look, here's an upcoming milestone. Uh, we're going to be reporting to the Board of Selectmen, updating this project where we stand on this. And, and they have time to um, be gearing toward that and be prepared. And so that that way, hopefully, that we can be able to count on more substantive updates to keep the critical projects moving forward and also to review with not only the board but the public what some of these key milestones are and to vet that you know um, through the chairman of the board so that we can uh, use the upcoming agenda item as a vehicle to kind of set that forward so we can communicate with people as to you know where they stand and and no you can count on we're gonna have an update on this we're gonna have not not say you know what, what happened to this and, and what happened to that so um, that's a, a project that we'll be working on and, and Bill's going to be a great help. We're going to involve um, all the staff and, and try to suggest, uh, you know, some more detailed um, updates as we come through so that you can count on those. I think uh, as Bob indicated regarding milestones and projects, uh, a lot of departments are creating product that is permit applications. Uh, RFPs for procurement and the public sees these things advertised and they're probably asking you what's going on with that what's up with this so 
seeing you at those milestones with some of those products means that uh, you're able to communicate with the public. We're communicating through you to the public. Because I think at, at the milestone type of stage, you know where we are when we're coming to you and saying, we're going into permitting now. This is where we are. We anticipate this length of permits. Or we're going to advertise for the, uh, for the consultant, things like that. So it makes sense to follow the milestones. And there, is enough, there are enough projects to keep your agendas full if we use that type of system. It makes sense, everybody? Sounds good. Yeah. yeah, I think one of the things that I don't want to lose track of is the fact that I think you guys have done a great job in preparing us for town meeting, okay, and handling the budget um, and the articles. Uh, we, we've, done, we've done very well in staying on top of the budget and staying and getting our – so when we, when we go to town meeting, we're, we're in pretty good shape in terms of preparation. And um, so the first cut of looking at the schedule for me would be, you know, which departments do we need to get in, when do we need to get them in here. So in drafting the upcoming agenda items, the first cut I would start with is looking at what do we need to do, since we, we know we don't want to lose pace on the budget and the prep for town meeting. Right thinking through, okay, what do we need to fill in uh, in order to keep, keep that same, again, robust pace? Um, no, because I think, um, you know, since, you know, Bob, since you've been here, we've, I, this is, you know, we have to go back a while, but it's been a while since we've been this prepared and this on top of things going into town meeting, and I think that's been great. Um, so we should start there, and then on top of that, I think it's great to be looking at the projects. Um, the other thing that I think is helpful to also figure out is, um, you know, I mean, I hate to say it, but there are some initiatives that we haven't yet tackled, right? Um, things on the to-do list, mm -hmm. all right? And there may be a need for us to maybe, you know, maybe in a workshop setting environment go over the the to-do list and figure out, get, getting a sense from the board where those ought to be, you know, in terms of priorities, you know, where, they, where should they fit in, which, which are the ones that we need to really start digging into. For example, at the last meeting I brought up archives, right? No one wants to talk about archives, no one wants to talk about records retention, records management, but you know what? It's really on the list, it's kind of like you know, we got to, we're going to have to deal with it. So where does that fit? Because there are probably some other ones just like it mm -hmm. that are hanging out there as well. So in addition to the projects, there's the to-do list, uh, the, what we what we have often called the legacy mm -hmm. stuff, right? Things that, you know, were sort of left over and uh, we need to sort of either fix them or find a way to address them. So. You know, and, and there's a whole, sh you know, laundry list. I don't need to go over those tonight, but I think those need to be factored in as well. So, yeah, I think, I think, I think, and there may be some value, Mr. Chairman, in just having a workshop meeting where what we do is we literally, you know, maybe we take a special night where we just focus on scheduling, going over and preparing our schedule for the coming year and sort of beginning to fill in. So... You know, our, the administrator comes in with, you know, a list of some of the things that we need to consider, and then we have a workshop discussion about where, how we want to lay them out. Starting off, I, I, again, I would say I'd start off with the budget stuff and the department reviews and so forth. Um, but then there's always the ongoing business of meeting with committees, right? Mm -hmm. that's, wastewater? Yeah. Well, we, uh, that's, a pro that's a project, and that's sort of obviously at the top mm -hmm. of the list. Um, but, you know, there are those projects, there are committees we need to hear from and interact with. Um, I know there's been a lot of talk about, you know, St. Patty's Day Parade and the, the Community Economic Development Committee, and, you know, we know we've got them on our radar screen, and we know that, you know, something's got to be happening soon on that. So yeah. I, leave, I leave it to, to, I would leave it to the chair and the administrator to sort of help lay out all of those items 
and begin the process of filling in the blanks, but there may be some value in having a workshop session to go over some of the other missing pieces and the other pieces to this and get everybody's input in shaping this out. So I just put that out there. Anyone else? Okay, let's look at the actual agenda item, which is the 19th, I guess, is the next meeting. Now, we had hoped to do, we wanted to do the, the Matic Keys discussion in conjunction with um, the discussion of the use of school buildings at ME Small, ME Small with, the, um, with the superintendent of schools. Mm -hmm. And um, we scheduled one, but then we just got late notice that the um, superintendent can't make the 19th. And he got um, dislocated. So what we were thinking of putting the Mattakees on when we, that first meeting in, January when we can get the, the superintendent here as well. Because there's a, a lot of things that impact the whole direction of what's going on up there with the school department. That makes a lot of sense to me. Yeah, so he'd be available for that first meeting in January. So we just kick over that Maddox. Uh, he's he's on, he's scheduled tentatively now for the 9th. For the 9th, okay. The 9th, and, and so what? That's, okay. Make that that could be a big workshop night for Mattakees and the schools. Would we be able to hear about the reuse committee at that time, or where we're sitting at that? We we can. We uh, we've been working on the schools uh, with a potential proposal, so we're going to be bringing that in and talk to you about the sort of utilization. Yeah, I, I'm speaking. You know, we're talking about one. We might as well talk about both of them at the same right, time. Right. Yeah. Right. It'll be it'll be the entire site ostensibly is what we're looking. And the at. committee, everything. Yeah. Oh, right. good. Oh, excellent. Uh, we do have the CIP committee, which generally comes into you uh, December 1st. Their CIP is due. They've finished that. It goes to Finance Committee, and we've arranged meetings between Finance Committee and CIP on the 13th, I believe, around there. Uh, what we'll probably want to do is come in on the 19th with the CIP. Uh, that allows the board to have an early understanding of warrant articles and projects. We're also going to bring in, we have an online portal now for CIP, uh, so we'll show you how that works. But both uh, Judy Tarver uh, and Sandy Fife, uh, the chair and the vice chair respectively of CIP would come in uh, with me and do the presentation we normally do. And uh, the charter requires December 1st. We have it done, uh, but typically what happens is as you go through warrants, some of the CIP items change and Dennis doesn't vote till later, their CIP. So Somewhere in February, we come back with the budget, with the CIP, with all those issues reconciled. So the CIP reflects what's going to town meeting and what Dennis voted on in <laughs> past years. And we've had issues with Dennis voting something down and we voted something up. So on the 19th, we can bring in a CIP if you wish, and then you'll see it again when you see the budget, you know, reconciled to everything else. Anybody have any thoughts on that? Sounds good. It looks okay. Feels in there. So we'll put them on the 19th if all goes well then. Um, and move Maddox out. Mm. Then we have this town seal committees coming in. CEDC, special event funding. And I think are we going to have an opportunity um, at that time, Bob, to discuss the St. Patrick's Day Parade, the yeah, status of it, gonna, funding we're, of it? We're going to go St. Patrick's Day Parade together with the CEDC situation. We're going to do that in the night. Yeah, we'll do that all in that. That's going to be all in the night. Okay. Because okay. uh, we made some, we made some, in my opinion, some very, um, some very good progress good. with with those folks. Be good to hear. Bob, uh, I won't let the cat out of the bag. Was it was for next time? But he he actually went down and had an in-person meeting with with them, and uh, had to go to the city. And uh, I talked to him before and after the meetings. Both he did a great job. He really did. He was very prepared and and uh, made some very. Um, convincing arguments and some um, represented the town's position extremely well. 
So. So that would be good. Hopefully we can nail that down. Um, anything else? Anybody want to say about the 19th? I think that's great. No, I think we've got a... Pretty full. Yeah. Pretty full? Okay. Good. All right. Thank you, Peter. So we'll go then to individual items. Does anybody have anything? Um, no, I'm, uh, when the town administrator report comes up, I'm interested in getting an update on the uh, Route 6A workshop. Dan, anything? Dorcas, did you hear that, Bob? Uh, no. Okay. No, not at this time. No, so we have no individual items. We go to the consent agenda next. Consent agenda. And on the consent agenda was a request for select board to sign Higgins Crow Road closing docks, which we've done tonight. Amendments to shellfish regs, which we signed. Wise living change of hours. Mm -hmm. And licensing renewal. Oh, licensing renewals. Tough one, huh, Bob? There's some. Yeah, it was very problematic. Um, Dakota was beside herself. She made multiple entreaties, and, and there were still some people that refused to get their paperwork in during November, and that triggers that state law thing where if you don't get your renewal application signed in November, you have to apply for a new license. So the ones that are listed there have to apply for a new license, and I, I just think that that's awful. I know the Crazy Rooster Four of them. was one. Oh. Crazy Rooster, Freebird, Golden Jalapeno, and the Olympia Fish. All of them. So they were not, they're not going to have licenses at the end of the year. Oh, wow. They're going to have businesses that can't serve alcohol. That's crazy. But they were notified and obviously yeah, staff chased them multiple times. And I don't think we can help them out of this situation. No, you're not allowed to sign for them. They have to physically do it themselves. Wow, that's too bad. And not only should you know they know that w without having us chase them down, then you chase them down three, four times, and and then no one responds. It's yeah. it makes it very difficult. And <coughs> we've horrible. we've had the same thing with the alcohol education. That's too bad. The vast majority of people are very cooperative. You get two, three, four that. You got to chase them all over the globe, and <laughs> then they end up in here, you know, on a, on a show cause notice. Um, why? I, I, I don't get it, but yeah. Yeah, I, I can't think of it. And since you've been here, Bob, I can't think of any of our businesses being in this position. Can you? No. Awful. May yeah. I ask again what yeah. those four were? Freebird, Olympia Fish, Rooster, and what was the fourth one? Golden Jalapeno. Golden jalapeno, thank you. Um, so anyway, Mr. Chairman, I'd move the consent agenda. Second. Okay. A motion and a second on the consent agenda. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Anyone opposed? That passes unanimously. And um, town administrator updates is the next and last item. Okay, thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. I'm, I'm very happy to see that we're going to um, do a deep dive on the capital improvement program on the 19th. Um, that is going to be great. I could not be more proud of the town's efforts, and it's all build the organization of it um, that, that meets the, the vision that I had for a capital improvement program. Um, you know, back when I first met this board, we talked about that, and um, I really feel good about that. Um, the process, how the, the financing program is in there, and all of the details. So, so that's great, and the timing is good because. Um, we want to get that initial discussion out of the way to allow us to move right into the budget process. I just want to give you an update that our annual town budget process is definitely um, underway. Before you leave the capital. Say that one more time. Before you leave the capital, it needs to be pointed out that because we're in a stronger position financially, and there's a lot of credit to go around on that, we actually can have a capital plan that we can be basically implement. Um, I just want to just point out that because of our financial pressures and the financial problems for many years, we had a capital plan, but that we couldn't really do a heck of a lot with it. 
Um, but it's nice to not only have a plan that's well done, that's well managed, and uh, is, is very comprehensive, but it's also nice to be in a position, like I said, thanks to a lot of uh, collective efforts here, that we actually can put some money towards it and actually begin implementing it. So I think that needs to be noted, because I, I know we're not the only ones frustrated by this. There are a lot of departments that have been frustrated by the lack of real progress on capital planning, but uh, it's nice to see us in this position that we're in right now. Well, so let's, let's not be crazy. We're not promising anyone any, any funds, <laughs> but I, no, I, I mean, it's a, it's a point well taken, but I, I think that the, uh, the idea that the previous capitals that I, I've seen didn't even have funds associated with them. You couldn't tell what was going to be done and what was going from where, and it, it is a methodical right. approach that's more in keeping with the type of capital pro programming that I've uh, become accustomed to and, and Bill um, has done a tremendous job with it. So I, I think you're going to be happy with just the, the, the product of that plan. Um, before we even have the first dime, um, the, the plan is in place that the local residents can interact with that and, and figure out the town's priorities, what we're looking at doing. So at any rate, thank, thank you for, for that. And um, <clears throat> I was segueing at, at that point in, into the budget process that we are in full swing right now and I'm currently in the process of analyzing all of the budget requests that have been received from the town departments. Um, analyzing in, in very excruciating detail all available funding, working very closely with the finance department. Our new finance director is highly skilled to see her step right into the process and really start spreading her wings already. Uh, it's been tremendous. Uh, certainly, we are um, far in excess of available funds for all of the requests we have, and that, that includes capital as well as operating. But that's as it, as it should be. You know, we're asking town departments for initiatives, and uh, what we're, we're doing right now is finalizing our schedule to meet with every single department uh, to review the requests, the detail, and then the whole process needs to be built from zero um, right back up, um, and <clears throat> every cost center will be factored in. That is a process. It will dominate my schedule probably for the next two to three weeks, but I'll still be available for anything um, that you need. But we'll, we, we'll have meetings. I mean, they'll go all, all day when you get into some of these things. It's department after department after department. So um, we'll uh, be able to, by the time we get to the end of December, we'll have a recommended budget. We'll begin those discussions, so it'll be great in the meantime. We'll get the capital lined up, and you will be able to, you know, when we get to the point of meeting with the individual departments and things, be able to have your arms completely wrapped around the whole, you know, financial picture, budget process, well in advance of town meetings. So uh, we'll continue to work on, on that. I, I want to bring up, um, I'm glad that Mr. Sullivan w was on. Um, he brought up that there are two airport environmental assessment meetings scheduled for Monday at 2 to 4. There's a virtual meeting, and the, um, it will send out to board members, but for members of the public, the instructions on how to get on that um, virtual uh, airport environmental assessment meeting on the 12th, it's, it's 2 to 4, and you have to go on the Town of Barnstable website to, to get the um, Zoom passcode to get in there, and also at 6 to 8, there's going to be an in-person meeting at the Barnstable uh, Town Hall. And um, <clears throat> I, I, I do, I, I also was a little surprised to see that, that they are requesting that all comments be submitted in advance in writing. Um, I, I think that that's a step, to me it's almost laughable, but um, I will say that I am coordinating uh, with our team, uh, you know, we still have the QED consulting, and, you know, we've been hammering some of the several key points that are improvements that will be tremendous improvements for the town that um, all along the airport was indicating that they're not opposed to some of the primary things involved with, if you recall, that voluntary flight path and publicizing this that, uh, you know, we are aware that 90% of the takeoffs are done with instruments that can be easily programmed to a voluntary flight path. And uh, we had previously heard 
all of the stories how you can't have a flight path because the pilot determines, well, the pilot has the ability in emergency situations to override their flight path, but all airports, we've learned this, um, and you know, we're ahead of the game now, all airports have the published um, coordinates for the voluntary flight plans, and, and those are the types of things that are gonna impact the airport performance to the extent that flights won't be directly over local residents' homes, and, and I, I think could be the, the difference between that airport being able to operate uh, adjacent to our community. So we will have um, that, that data in, in those comments, and, and this is another step in the process, but I just wanted to make sure everyone knew the meetings were coming up and that we are strong participants in this, and I, I also want to thank, I've had regular meetings with the Hyannis Park Civic Association, uh, their leadership is great. They're well aware of these issues, concerns, and we're working together on those um, as well. And so um, that's moving forward. I, I wanted to let folks know, I, I think some issues came up. Um, folks were talking about the Harbor Suites Hotel uh, this evening. Um, just a, a couple of quick points um, on that is that um, I found out today that their Zoning Board of Appeals public hearing um, is scheduled for January 11th. And that's relative to, uh, as you recall, the board authorized the enforcement action of the town's zoning with respect to the length of stay at the local uh, motels. Uh, and that is one of the units that received the violation notice. And in their case, they appealed that notice as they have a right to do to the Zoning Board of Appeals. So the process is, is they're entitled to a hearing before the Zoning Board of Appeals, and um, then they render an opinion either to uphold the decision of the enforcement officer um, or not, and uh, so we'll be presenting our case there. We encourage uh, anyone who's interested to go to that hearing. What time is it, Bob? Um, I, I don't have it, it, the time hasn't been published yet, but we'll get that information, and that'll be up on the website, we'll be, um, just waiting to get the exact time and and everything, but the, we know it's going to be on the eleventh. Uh, they have to set their docket for the times. Bob, does it take an appeal um, to trigger the state's um, overriding of our z uh, zoning? I don't think that there is such a thing as that. Um, but um, suffice to say, I, the way I would characterize it, right, is is that um, the state certainly seeks to maintain that housing, but um, w we don't see any overt evidence of an ability to specifically override zoning, and, and so I don't think that that, that would happen. Uh, however, you know, zoning is not the perfect tool, right? Um, there are ways of trying to get around that, but it would trigger if they had um, a strategy that would involve overriding zoning, that would be the time that they would have to do it because um, we provided them a notice of violation of the zoning, right? So then that is is done at the, the Zoning Board of Appeals level and then you could uh, ostensibly try to sue us in court over it, um, but we feel at, at the point that it goes through the ZBA, then we would file in the court for an injunction against them. And I think that that is the okay. point that they would have to okay. determine, you know, what type of strategy that they would employ. And I haven't seen any strategies to date that have said, yeah. said your letter, well, we, we're the state, so we overrule your zoning. But there's other strategies that, you know, we've talked about that, you know, we might have to battle. At the court level, and it's hard to say what the state would do, but they might move to intervene at that point in the case. Um, I, I know, what was it, the, in the Bourne case with the Board of Health? Yes. And they had certain health regulations that were being violated. Um, the state basically wrote the Board of Health a letter and said, we don't think, you, you, we don't think these uh, regulations are applicable in, 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 in periods of states of emergency. And, um, as far as I know, I, I don't know what the outcome was, but I think I think they they backed off. 
I think the I think the Board of Health backed off. But I think, I think they chose to back off. But but see the action, as Bob said, the action would really be the town of Yarmouth versus a particular business entity, right? Let's let's just talk hypotheticals because it doesn't really matter who the town is proceeding against. They're going against ABC Corporation. They're really not going against um, the state. They're not. But <clears throat> in Bourne, the state wrote this letter, and I think everybody's seen it. I, mean, I know we've had it in our email um, where they said, well, when the legislature funded this emergency housing program, that was ta a tacit approval of, of these emergency powers and things like that. So um, it remains to be seen what will happen, but for now at least, for now, it's a beef between the town and the, and the uh, business owner. Is there a concurrent hearing with the Yarmouth Resort? No, the Yarmouth Resort is proceeding directly to um, litigation so that is an, in town council's lap to get into the court and get an injunction, and that's what they're working on filing that filing now. Um, hasn't been filed yet, but they're working on that because they don't get to go to the Zoning Board of Appeals because they did not file a timely file appeal. appeal. So, so that process may be, may be quicker. Um, so the, the two of them, are, those are the two facilities, the only two facilities that they were aware of that have zoning violations. Um, and those two have uh, been the subject of enforcement. See, there, there's a provision in the law that you have to exhaust your administrative remedies. Right. So if, if you have to, if you're supposed to go through step two to get before you go to court, and you don't go through step two, and the court's going to say, "Hey, right. you know, we can't accommodate you because if you had gone through step two, who knows, you might have prevailed." Right, but you didn't do that. You didn't care enough to do that. So, you'll generally, if you skip any administrative steps, will not look too kindly at you. Now, two other things I just wanted to mention on the Harbor Suites, so that you're aware. That the first is, uh, you know, folks have seen. There's a couple of trucks out in in front, and there's a little fenced off area, and they're in there digging, and the um, the hotel is installing some electric vehicle chargers. Uh, with the appropriate local permits that, um, uh, to my understanding, doesn't have anything to do with the migrant housing. But I still get people um, sit across the street and take pictures, which we've asked people not to do because, um, you know, that's kind of harassment of the whole situation. You know, we'd like to just go the enforcement route. Um, but um, if, if people do have those questions, uh, that's what the, that uh, construction is. And the, the second item that was mentioned this evening that um, I wanted to bring up I, I didn't raise any alarm on this um, because of the the nature of the report I have received um, within the last two days from uh, the Board of Health and it is with respect to the medical testing of um, the individuals in the migrant program staying at the the harbor suites and there was the, it was it was stated that there were uh, instances of tuberculosis. And, and I just need to make everyone clear that um, if an individual contracts tuberculosis, the traces of that disease remain in your body you know, forever. And um, so uh, long after uh, you have active tuberculosis that you know, it can be detected. And that's exactly what has occurred with um, a small number of the residents there that they had um, identified through their medical testing these latent uh, tuberculosis infections that were not active, um, were from years previous, are not contagious or active in any way, shape, or form, and the individuals there do not have well. symptoms of, of that. So. Um, the, based on the information I received from the Board of Health that there's absolutely no risk to our general population um, as a result of, of those cases, I, you know, I, I didn't raise it to a level to uh, attempt to convince people that there was an active threat when, when there's not. In, in fact, you know, there are actual people that have nothing to do with the migrant program that do have active cases of tuberculosis in our community. 
and, and those are being managed uh, you know, by case professionals handling in a certain way, but, but they don't involve these folks. And so um, the, the Board of Health in giving me this information, they you know, made sure that I understood it and that um, I, I was careful not to uh, present this information in a way that may um, you know, spike fear in the community that there are active cases of tuberculosis associated with um, the, the migrant housing there. So I just wanted to make you aware of that and I can get a, a fuller report on, on all of the details of how that latent situation and what you know, the, the Board of Health is doing with their test results. But I just yeah, wanted to make that clear to the uh, website. Was it your understanding what the lady said that there was about approximately four cases? Um, I had... Uh, do we, do you, did you, were you given a number? Yeah, I, I, I think it was between two and four. Between two and so, so con relatively consistent with what she said. Certainly not a, a large number. Right. And not active cases. That's the important thing. Zero case. active cases. That's interesting. I didn't know what you just said about the fact that it stays in your body even when it's uh, ad medically addressed. And yeah, I learned that as well. If we get that on the website, we'll kind of dampen the the hysteria that may come out of those comments tonight. So I'm working on trying to get, get another update. We haven't had a lot to update. I, I didn't want to keep roiling the water. It's been static since the enforcement notices went out and since the state has determined that they capped their program. But And the next thing we want to talk a little bit about, there was a great um, Route 6A forum that, that was held up at the fire station. Um, I wasn't able to make it my, myself, but um, a lot of the feedback that I received and I reviewed some of their, their plans, it looks like that some of the strategies are, um, you know, resonating with, with at least some of the residents out there. Did they do like a presentation that we could get a copy of? Yes. There, I have a detailed presentation. There's um, slides and it has the actual depictions of, um, you know, the, the streetscape solutions. and. You know, one thing that was good is, you know, we, we spent the last year, we had so many forums and feedback mm -hmm. on what folks were looking for, and um, I, the, the ideas, you know, resonated in there. People didn't want to see a lot of big curbs, a lot of built-up stuff to try to keep it as natural of an environment as possible, preserve parking where possible. And the one issue, I, I think in terms of the actual physical streetscape part, um, it appears that, you know, that there's a, a, a good plan in place that, that has, you know, kind of minimal improvements, but it does make it a, a little nicer, restore some of the areas that have deteriorated. But there is another issue that uh, we haven't been able to address that I, I think, you know, we have to think about whether, you know, we want to have the town jump in the middle of this or, or encourage the local businesses to, but there uh, is... I think the continuing feeling that there's a, a large amount of space for parking that is located behind the businesses that is not effectively managed in a way that shares the opportunity for parking among all of the businesses, um, you know, for one reason or another, uh, the business community hasn't been able to organize themselves to leverage that area. Um, and. You know, I'm not saying that the town goes in and takes the area. You know, it would be mm -hmm. horrible to, to, to kind of do that, but um, what help that we can give them to organize the parking, get the appropriate signage to share the, the, the facilities, uh, it, it just strikes everyone that if all of that space could be um, laid out properly and, and used you know, it's some, not very dissimilar to historic districts in, look at Chatham, you know, and, and some of the other towns with the historic downtowns. Those are areas where the town has gone in and consolidated that property and then operates it as, as parking. But um, there's got to be a way to leverage the area that is there so that parking can be done behind the businesses in that central core. And, and I think that un, until that really moves forward, there's, there's always going to be a pinch, <coughs> you know? I would agree. Mm -hmm. Is there any 
speaking of parking in that whole area, has there any been any discussion with the uh, the folks that are renovating one of the buildings next to the Cooperative Bank? You know, the old Bank America. You know that property. Urology over there? Associates. Yeah. You know, there's a substantial amount of parking over there. That would have been an area to have worked some kind of arrangement out. Is that on the table at all in any of these scenarios? Well, we haven't, um, as as a community, gone in to try to put together all of the off-street parking yeah, options because they're all private property. But um, yeah. we've been just, I think, looking a lot at the, yeah. the streetscape to try to square that away, and folks don't want a lot done. Yeah. It's huge inside, though. It's huge. Yeah. I just, you just look at that parcel there. There's a significant amount of real estate. Right in front of the building. Exactly, and along the side. And uh, you would think that some kind of accommodation could have been made, could be made. Um, I know that when the restaurant across the street, the old Optimus Cafe, when they were mm. coming. Old jalapeno. Before, yeah, the, <laughs> the outfit that I guess won't be getting their license renewed anytime soon. Um, <coughs> The, uh, they had indicated they had made an arrangement with the folks across the street. So, you know, I was thinking that maybe that could yield some opportunities everyone. That for everyone in that area. But uh, I'm not sure anything's well, that really part been. needs it needs more work. But, but it's, it's, you know, not without its possibilities. And, and when folks come, you know, to the meetings, we should remind <coughs> each and every one of them is that, look, uh, there needs to be a cooperative effort in the village of sharing some of these resources and working together. And if we do, there's a lot that can be achieved. But it, you know, when it, when you're dealing with private property, uh, you know, the the town doesn't go in, you know, it, and just wave its wand. Pe people are going to have to come yeah. to the table, and 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 I. But but I I think the level of sort of um, cooperation and uh, improved. Yeah, I, I think it has improved. When we first started, it was just um, it was it was like the Palestinians and the and the Israelis. That I felt you know in a mini version, so to speak. But if it's improving, that's terrific. You know, there are, you know, there was a time when the state government had programs. You know, Bill's been around a long time, like I have, where we had programs to help underwrite parking in small urban areas. Um, yeah, urban renewal. <laughs> there what, the, there, PWED used to do that. Yeah, PWED. I mean, who knows, maybe Mass Works. But there may, there, there may be some opportunities. Again, if there's a spirit of cooperation, you know, it's amazing the kinds of things that can be achieved. And, uh, you know, if the property owners are willing to cooperate, there could be something done potentially in joint measure with the town. So, but I'm glad to hear that uh, things are going well, where things are moving in a f direction. I guess the question for the chairman and, and the board is, are we ripe for uh, an agenda item on this particular topic, or do we need to let sort of the parties kind of continue to deliberate and work on things? Because obviously, as, as you've heard, there's a lot of board interest in, in, in this whole topic. And, yeah, I uh, think, you know, in order to, to before we get it, here again, we need to just let the, um, we'll distribute all of the options out to you and, and get, I think, a little more feedback from where people are coming from on the potential options. Mm -hmm. And before anything is selected, before any direction is set, mm -hmm. critical milestone is to be right back in front of this board and hopefully with um, local residents where at least some of them express, you know, some support, support for, for a part particular direction. That'd be great. But we'll be back in front of the board before anything else is done. Sounds good. That's all I have. Anything else? Nope. I'll say. I have a motion to adjourn. So moved. Second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 We're adjourned. Thank you.